How is everybody? Thank you, worship team. I appreciate that. Um, what I'm going to do at the beginning is throw out some burner material just to make sure the sound people are happy with everything. So um, I'm going to open with some stuff that's not really my sermon. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Matthew. Um, I have the privilege of serving as the associate pastor here at Hope Chapel. Um, specifically, though, here today is uh, the nursery, the baby room in our house. So that's exciting. Welcome to our home. I appreciate that you uh, are over. Um, can I get you anything? Just joking. I cannot get you anything. Um, due to self-isolation, I'll only be telling inside jokes. Can you hear me now? Um, lately, I've been um, ordering things on <laughs> the internet, and I know that you guys uh, know that due to people ordering everything online, there's sort of a delay. And so as an experiment, I went ahead and got on Amazon and I ordered a chicken and an egg. And I'll let you know which one comes first. That was just a little joke. Okay. Um, I appreciate you guys' patience. Um, I really do. Oh, thanks for the rim shot, Evan. I appreciate that. Um, I appreciate everybody on the live chat contributing to the, the Hope Chapel experience. Um, can somebody put on the live chat the, yes, I am a dad. My dad joke. Thanks, Paul Gray. You actually can tell a joke is going to turn into a dad joke when the punchline becomes apparent. <sighs> That's awful. Okay, so I saw at the highest number, <laughs> um, 103 people watching. That's incredible. So appreciate that. Th thanks for the laughter, Sarah. I appreciate that. Um, I also want to uh, say hello to everybody who's watching on a TV or another device or they're not on the live chat. We love you too, just as much, except Antron mentioned earlier that that is the heckling channel. I think he and Mr. Martin decided that that's the heckling channel. So if you do want to heckle me, that's where I'll be looking. Just wanted you to know, I've got my sermon notes, the, uh, the screen that I'm co communicating with uh, the sound booth people, the live chat, my notes, and my phone out if you want to text me. So I'm in millennial heaven, really, millennial preacher heaven. I've just got all my screens just right here. So I'm excited about that. We're really grateful for technology. And I just want to give a special shout out to um, Bill Ledbetter and Jerry Latham for working with me this week. They spent a good deal of time. <laughs> thanks. They spent a good deal of time um, making sure that this would work. We pre-recorded it just in case it didn't. But a lot of thought and preparation has been put into this. And I just want to say a huge thank you to the tech guys. So uh, virtual claps, that's good. <laughs> um, we're gonna have a WebEx congregational meeting. And I, yesterday morning I put together, so I slapped together a video of what it looked like on my computer to click on one of those Web, WebEx links and download the software and load it. And I'm gonna send that to you. So if you've never done a WebEx before, you'll at least see what it looked like on my computer to get started with a WebEx, just to make you feel more comfortable. Um, Gino explained why I'm home. Um, just out of politeness, you know, Mandy works at a, as a, a nurse at a big hospital and, um, you know, just trying to be conscientious. If she has it, I have it. Uh, this morning, Anna is the uh, teacher for the pre-K and the first grade class at my house and Zoe is uh, teaching the nursery. So that's exciting. <clears throat> we actually have two blue shirts too. So this, this could be official. They might walk in to get a diaper behind me, but probably not. I think they're set. Um, Send the kids in during the sermon, Paul Gray's request. We might do that. Um, <clears throat> I know that this is odd. And I, I just want to say off the bat that I'm used to preaching into a camera. Uh, I YouTube. I'm a YouTuber. I upload content onto YouTube. Um, but I do know that, th that not everybody is comfortable with that. And I, I have no judgment for that. Um, I think it's okay. Um, hey, son. This is Jack. He is in Anna's class this morning. Just say hi and then go back to Anna, okay? And Hi. I'll go back to mama. Yeah. There's Jack. Maybe he wants to preach. Maybe that's just a confirmation on his calling. But I wanted you to know that if you're not used to YouTube um, sermons and live streaming, that that's okay. Like, there's a reason why it's not the same. I was actually thinking about the word church in the New Testament, like to the church at um, Corinth or the, to the church at Rome, that kind of word church. That Greek word was used to substitute, <laughs> yeah, thanks to you, um, 
that word was used to substitute a Hebrew word in the Old Testament that meant assembly. It actually, that noun assembly word comes from a verb that means to gather, to gather people together. And you see that gathering um, when people are gathered before Mount Sinai, or they're gathered before Moses, or they're gathered before the elders. It's a literal physical spatial gathering. And when they translated from Hebrew into Greek, they used this same word, church, to refer to those assemblies. And so there's a significant sense in which the word church itself means to gather together physically, spatially. And if it kind of hurts that you can't be together, um, you're not off track there. I think that you sense something correctly in it. It, it. It's painful. At the same time, it's cool that we have technology to make it better, but it's not the same. I affirm that pastorally. And um, I want you to know that we look forward to the day where we don't have to do things like this. Yes. Yeah, thanks, Lissette. We do love Jack. We love Jack. He's an awesome guy. Okay. Um, I, I said that I, the biggest number I saw in the live stream was one on three. Put in the live chat the highest number you saw. It's really interesting. Kudos to everybody for reaching out to people online this last week. Um, I saw quite a few things. Thomas Cogdell, you put in that live concert. That was cool. Joe Hootman, I joined your Zoom. Uh, if you guys didn't join Joe Hootman's Zoom, um, you can go back on the Realm, see his posts about it. I think he's going to do it again. It was basically just a time where we could all work on our emails or do stuff together. So there's a bunch of screens of us working. And then there were some conversations. And that was really cool. So if you had, didn't check out the first one, uh, you can see the second one. That's good. Uh, I just want to say I appreciate everybody reaching out to other people. I've heard of a lot of connections. If you want to make some connections, if you've heard of a need, um, you can reach out to Gino or you can reach out to me and we'll try to help connect. If you have resources you want to give or if you need resources, we would love to help you. Okay, so um, I did all my intro material and some jokes and it sounds like uh, the sound booth people are happy with everything. So at this point, I'm going to transition and uh, thank you for everybody talking. <laughs> I know, Lorraine, thank you. It's, it's, new to, it's new to lots of people and the live stream is kind of weird, but Anyway, we still love each other, and God is still present with us. So the sermon, though, I'm going to transition now, is going to be based in Matthew chapter 5, and I'm going to I'm getting all sorts of text here, and I love it. Appreciate it. Millennial heaven. Oh, my wife is saying, Matt, talk a little slower, honey. Okay, honey, I will talk a little slower. I did have my coffee, though. So what I want to do is talk about how Jesus interacts with the old covenant, how Jesus teaches from the law, how our view of Jesus' relationship to the old covenant forms the basis of what the new covenant is, and how that helps us grow in our faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. I'm going to give you a thumbnail sketch of everything I'm going to say, because at first it might sound like super legalistic, and then at the end it might sound like super hyper grace. But the whole thing is, I, I would call, a logic of Christ, the logic of the body of Christ broken for us. So um, I'm going to start with sort of a tension. Uh, it's, if you have a, actually, if you have a physical Bible, go ahead and get it out. I know we're doing everything techie this morning, but I'm going to read a big chunk of Matthew chapter 5. If you want, you can press pause now and have somebody in your family read it especially if you're watching after the fact. If you want to watch live and you don't want to get um, behind, that's fine. You can mute it, then have somebody read. We're going to read Matthew 5, 17 till the end of the chapter. And then I'll, I'll wave my hands when I'm done reading if you want to unpause. And if you don't want to do that, that's fine. I just thought maybe that's a way where you could sort of interact more. Okay. This is Jesus. Now, please be patient with me. I'm reading a, a large chunk. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. 
Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms with him. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard, and you'll be put in prison. Truly, you will never get out until you've paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely. You shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say simply be yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. Almost done here. You guys are doing great. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Okay, I'm done reading. So if you guys want to unmute me, uh, thanks to those of you that read. Thanks for those of you who listened. And thanks for everyone anyway, no matter what. <laughs> so uh, thanks for everybody still chatting on the live stream. I appreciate that. Okay, that was intense. Um, we just listened to Jesus preach a sermon, which is a cool thing to know. Another cool thing to know is we just listened to Jesus preach a sermon based on the Old Testament. And I have heard, oh, yeah, I have heard a lot of um, interpretations of what's going on here. I'm going to offer you one that I think, I for sure did not come up with this, that I think explains what's happening here. But before I do, I'm going to offer some tension. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says, Do not think I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. He says that until heaven and earth pass away, which has not happened yet. Nothing is going to pass from the law until all is accomplished. And yet we know from Romans chapter 6, verse 14, that sin has no dominion over us because we are not under the law, but under grace. The question is, how do those things cohere together? A good answer to that is a solid foundation for our faith. An odd answer to that could be a, uh, a crumbling foundation and it could be a disaster for us. So I hope we're all on the same page there about the setup. Now, um, I noticed that Jesus spoke from the Old Testament here, and we have our first slide is going to help me explain what I think he did. So I'm not going to do these in order. I'm actually going to do the last antithesis first because it's such a good example of what I think Jesus is really doing. See, he brings up, you have heard it said, but I say, you know, and you might think like, oh, you've heard it said, he's talking about the Old Testament. But I say, and he's starting a new thing. And that's sort of a, 
that's an easy thought to come into your mind. And I understand why that comes into your mind. It's almost in a cartoonish way. It would seem like um, the Old Testament was God's beta test. And he's figuring out how to be deity. And, uh, you know, he's just trying to do a course correction, if you will, just sort of see what works. And now he's fixing it. Um, and I think that's, that's silly. And of course, that's silly. Um, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. We know that God is good yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And it's not that he had to cut his teeth for a while and figure out how to be God. Um, he's always known what he's doing. And he's always interacted with people in a spiritual way. You know, even in the Old Testament, we see that the Old Testament gets, doesn't get enough credit. Um, it gets accused of being a harsh, external, legalistic religion. But God is never, yes, thanks, thanks, on. Um, God is uh, God is never not God, and God is never not good. And we see even um, kind of close to the beginning of Deuteronomy, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your might. We are not dealing with Jesus coming in to a system of false religion that's external, harsh, and legalistic, and then internalizing it. What do we see that he is doing? Let's start with the first one. Loving your, well, okay, we're actually going to start with the last one. My first example is the last one, the love your enemies one. Jesus said, you've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Okay. Is that in the Old Testament? Okay. Part of it is. <laughs> I was giving room for you guys to live chat, but there's a little bit of a lag. So that'd be too much of a pause. Um, you've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor. Is that in the Old Testament? Yes. Is and hate your enemy part of the Old Testament? No. So, part of what he said was scripture. Part of what he said wasn't. So, if he's refuting something, you might think he's refuting the scripture part, but I actually don't think he is. Instead of saying, you know, the Torah says love your neighbor, uh, but that's not good enough. I'm saying you should love everyone. No, that's not what he's saying. He's saying, the Torah says, love your neighbor. What that means is you should love even your enemies. Because when they ask Jesus in another place, who's my neighbor? He tells the story of the Good Samaritan. He's not helping us by tearing down what didn't work. Like God tried some stuff and it didn't work. It was God's beta test. He was, he's just working on his whole divinity thing. Okay, I'm still, I'll talk slower, honey. Um, Mandy is looking out for you guys because she loves you. Um, <clears throat> I love you too. It's not that God had a trial run and had to come in halfway through and fix it. Jesus was helping them understand that the heart of God was for us to love all people all along. It wasn't a new thing. Okay. Where did the second part come from? Somebody asked. Uh, it's, it's not exactly clear how familiar everybody would have been with... Uh, that statement, perhaps it was one of those like blog things that was just going around. Maybe even the teachers of the law were irritated by it, or maybe some of their teachers were saying it. But the reason Jesus brings it up is because at least in Jesus' mind, that is something they have been hearing. Thank you for the question. J.H. Oh, that's Joe. Thanks, Tilden. I appreciate that. So the next example is divorce. Jesus says, it was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. Okay, same kind of problem. Is he just saying all oh, that Old Testament stuff, we're going to throw that out and start a new thing? Or is he trying to clarify the heart of God? Man, I set that up as such an easy, that's a layup right there. He's clarifying the heart of God. That wasn't even a fair question, but <laughs> that's okay. Um, you can divorce. That's scripture. Is it true, though, that all you need is just a piece of paper and a whim? No. He's not saying Moses gave you the right to divorce, but that's no good. Moses was wrong. Instead, he goes back to Genesis and explains what the whole purpose of family was supposed to be all along. God invented family. He created family. He created uh, the heavens, the earth, water, plants, and he created family. So he's upholding um, the purity and the purpose of marriage, not trying to update the legal demands so that the cutting edge of religion is now correct. Apparently people were 
taking that permission to divorce and acting flippantly by doing it too much. Okay, I think that makes sense. So in my opinion, again, it's not just my opinion. I learned this from just countless theologians that have been saying this for a long time, that Jesus is explaining what the Torah was really saying all along. He's not tearing it down, and he's not necessarily even adding to it, because it's not like as if in the Old Testament, God didn't really care how flippant you were about divorce or whether you were loving to people or not, but now he starts caring. I think he always cared because he's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Let's go to the lust example. Sorry, kids at home. We're at Matthew 5. Now we're in verse 27. Um, you've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. Jesus says, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Okay, again, is Jesus changing the Torah? Well, did the Torah? Okay, here's the thing. One could say that this is an amplification of the Torah or an addition or an internalization, but I don't think so. See, God always wanted them to internalize. I mean, just read Stephen's speech, St. Stephen, the first martyr in the book of Acts. He's talking to the Sanhedrin as if God was always trying to pursue their hearts, and they weren't willing. It's not that God was giving external stuff and didn't care what was really happening in your heart, but then now he cares. I don't think so. Do we really think that God in the Old Testament would have said, don't commit adultery, but I, I don't care what you do up until that point? <laughs> no, that's absurd. Okay, so surely Jesus is defending the purpose and purity of marriage which is incidentally what the command not to commit adultery was meant to do all along. Okay. I'm not sure how to answer that, Andrea. Um, oaths. We're going to go to verse 33 now. Again, you've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord which you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all. Again, it seems like Jesus is playing good cop, bad cop with the Father here. But we should always remember they're on the same page because he says, I and the Father are one. Apparently, somebody could swear. No, I, again, based on what Jehudah was saying earlier, I don't know exactly who was saying what. It's almost like Jesus is bringing up some sort of a cultural zeitgeist or at least part of it. So apparently, one could swear on the gold in the temple. And that would be binding, but not on the temple itself. One could swear on the bread, but not on the table. And it seems like, by the way, <laughs> if we were there and we saw Jesus' facial expressions and tone of voice, it could be that this was one of those funny moments where he's making fun of stuff. And I think that was likely. Jesus is bringing up oaths. And he's trying to clarify, look, God owns the bread. God owns the table and the temple and the gold. He owns it all. What is the point of making this absurd infinite gradation of oaths that matter more or less based on the thing you're talking about. It's almost as if you have this hierarchy of what things you can oath upon. The oath matters more and less based on the stuff, not based on your word, which almost seems to empty the word part, which incidentally is what the command was trying to avoid, that we would just have false, empty oaths. Again, I don't think that Jesus is doing anything but rescuing the original intent of the law by showing us the heart of the Father in all of it, and he should know. Okay, retaliation, Matthew chapter 5, verse 38 and 39. He says, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Oh, yeah. John Martin made a good point. It also says you shall not covet, which is an inherently internal thing. You can't have an external legalistic code about internal things. It's sort of a contradiction in terms. That's a good point, John Martin. Uh, okay, so the retaliation thing. This is one of those places where uh, Christianity gets made fun of by the secular world, I think, because they misunderstand the command. Um, it is not the case that God is saying, hey, if somebody hurts your eye, you go out there and you get their eye. I want that to happen. Yeah, you revenge it up. No, 
God, would, God says vengeance is his. Okay, so what's the point of this law? Let's say, for example, I'm a, let's say, for example, I'm a prince and your servant girl is in my way in the marketplace and she trips me and I hurt my ankle and I'm so offended and I am so important and she's so not that in the justice system, my sprained ankle, which is going to heal in a few weeks, um, the damage done to me as an important person, what that corresponds to is that she has to have her foot cut off. That's a disproportionate response. Or perhaps I say, oh, you killed my mule. I'm going to kill two of yours. And this is something that would be an easy place for evil and revenge to get out of hand. This was a way to limit retaliation, to limit excess of evil getting out of control. So why would God want that? Because he cares about people. He cares about justice and vengeance is his. He doesn't want us to take revenge because you know that if somebody harms you, the instinct is to punch back twice as hard. That's our instinct. Well, it's at least mine. But God is saying, no, we're not taking revenge. What God cares about is justice. Why would God care about justice, not revenge? Because he cares about what's right. And what's right is um, the father heart of God per, per situation. So Jesus is not saying, yeah, the Old Testament view of things wasn't good enough. I'm going to add something onto it. No, he's saying, here, look at the heart of God. I'm going to explain it to you with more clarity. In fact, here's a way you can show non-retaliation. If someone hits you, give them the other one. A generous attitude is another way of not letting evil get out of hand. Okay, here's another example, the anger and murder one. Yeah, that's right, Donna Rowe, no more than an eye. So if you have an eye hurt, you can't have a disproportionate punishment. So anger and murder, verse 21 and 22. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. So Jesus is doing that same kind of thing again. You've heard that it was said, you shall not murder. We know that murder is wrong, and that's in the Torah. But let's say, for example, we're thinking in a hard-hearted kind of way. The law says don't murder. It doesn't say don't seriously maim. You know what I mean? That, <laughs> that kind of a thing. Um, or <laughs> I tried to murder the guy. It didn't work out, so I get a free pass. You know what I mean? Like, I'm just not good at murdering, and so the judge should just let me go because I can never pull it off anyway. <laughs> Do we really think that, that? Okay, so from being angry with somebody down the road all the way to killing them, it's a long and dark path. And do we really think that God never actually cared about that whole path? Do you know what I mean? Of course he cared about that whole path. Why? Because God loves people. You know, the, injection, the, the command not to murder in Genesis chapter 9 after the flood is based on the fact that people bear the image of God. That's why you shouldn't kill them. So, if people bear the image of God and you have to respect that, does that not, does, does that not imply way more than just not killing people? No, and Jesus is showing us what it actually means. Like, hey, <laughs> while you're at not killing people, why don't you also stop saying terrible things about them? So I'm going to come to a conclusion here after going through Jesus's sermon based on the Torah. Number one, that was for suspense. Did you guys know that the first rule of the suspense club is, I don't know why I do that to you. Sorry. Okay. Jesus speaks from the Torah authoritatively. The Torah is authoritative. He speaks about it with respect, and he shows us the Father heart of God in it. He's not trashing it as though it was some silly legalistic system that he, he's privileged to come to earth to update so that it, nobody has to go through it anymore. Goodness gracious, thank you that he came to do that. <clears throat> it's authoritative, but it's also frustrating. I don't know if your heart was pinched at all when I read verse 17 till the end of the chapter. Mine was several times. I thought, ooh, uh, um, I violated the principle behind that. Also, it's not just a principle. These are laws, because he said that the law is not going to pass away at all. 
But I remember just reading it like, you know, like 15 minutes ago when I read that chapter, it pricked me multiple times. And it's so frustrating because Jesus is, ex is expanding our understanding of what the law was this whole time. He's not doing away with any letter of it, he says. So that's frustrating too. Because the heavens and earth haven't passed away yet, and yet the law stands authoritatively. So why is it, why is it that we are not under the law, but under grace? Because here's the law, shown authoritatively for what it really is. Jesus showing it to you up close in person. It's too high, you can't go above it. You can't get under it. There's no shortcuts. You can't get around it. You can't run away from it. It will endure for all places, for all times, for all people. So what Jesus does is he tells you to pick up your cross and follow him. Because as Paul argues in Romans chapter 5, 6, and 7, the wages of sin is death. There's no way out from the law except by following Christ into his death. <clears throat> but here's to make some points uh, before I get to that. I mean, I, I made that point already, but I'm going to make it more in just a second. But just to add some icing to the cake here, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, I have a slide for this. We know that the law is good if one uses it properly. So one of the things I'm trying to do is, is to help us grow in respect for God's word, Old Testament and New Testament. This is God's word. Jesus preached from the Old Testament. He doesn't talk about the Old Testament disparagingly, and neither should we. We also know from the reasoning in Paul's letter to the Romans that the curse of, oh, in Galatians, that the curse of the law is still in effect for those who are trying to live under it. It's clearly in play because the curse would be everyone who does not abide by all the things written in the law and do. And yet, as Paul argues in, argues, as Paul argues in Romans 7, the law has only, only has authority over someone as long as they live. That's the key here. See, I think if we as Christians believe that we are under grace, not under law, because Jesus came along and sort of poofed the law, or any other sort of odd foundation where the house is divided, the father and the son don't seem to be on the same page, there's a good cop, bad cop thing, then I think that there's a restlessness that will sneak into your faith. Perhaps if you think, Jesus poofed the law, but it seems authoritative. What do I do about that? Let me assure you, it's authoritative, and it's over you, and it's intense, except, thanks be to God, you're dead. <laughs> the reason... Romans chapter 6, 14. The reason sin has no dominion over you is because you are under grace because of the broken body of Christ. You see, he invites us to get baptized into his death, which is not just his death. It's a union with Christ in the entire saving work of living, dying, being buried, resurrection from the dead, and ascension. It's almost as if we're seated with him in heavenly places. And as far as sin and the law are concerned, we are dead. And one thing I know about the legal system is we do not take dead people to court. Thank you, Chanika. Uh, appreciate it. The, uh, I, it's good to know that you guys are still listening, paying attention, and that the sound is still working. I love that. So I appreciate that. Um, the reason you have escaped from the law is not because God changed. It's not because the law went anywhere. It's because you died. See, this, the capital punishment of death covers everything so conclusively. Here's an example. If you are on death row and you are being, sorry for the morbid example, kids. If you are being brought to the chair, um, I think adults know what I mean by that. If you're being brought to the chair, and for whatever reason, you escape from the guards who are bringing you there, you steal their baton, and you hit one of the guards with it, and you run away and injure multiple people, and these would be felonies, by the way, I believe, but then they catch you again. Are they going to take you to the chair twice? 
are they going to put you back in your cell and say, oh, because of these recent felonies, you're going back to your jail and then the chair later? No, there's no point because the punishment of death is going to cover all of it, which is a really important thing for Christians to remember because we sort of incrementalize. It's because he texted me, Paul. Um, we incrementalize our sin. And so we think, okay, I dumped. <laughs> this is a silly example, but I think our minds think this way, and I'm trying to get you out of it. You might think, oh, well, I came to Christ in uh, 1996. I don't know why. I don't know what's going on with that accent. I came to Christ in 1996, and he covered all those sins. But what about the sins since then, brother? It's like, <laughs> bro, the example of the chair is meant to do this. The capital punishment is the most extreme punishment. It covers all of it. And Jesus endured it. He swallowed up death completely. It's not that Christ has to die and then die again for the 90s years and then die again for the early 2000s and then die again for the 20 teens and then die again for the 2020s. He died once for all. And your inclusion into his death is awe-inspiringly, profoundly deep and complete. I want to read to you something from Romans chapter 7, verse 4. You died to the law through the body of Christ. I'm going to pair that with Colossians chapter 2, verse 14. Sorry, sound guys, I just added this last second. But he canceled the record of debt by the, 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 the debt that stood against us with its legal demands. He set that aside by nailing it to the cross. But Jesus said the law is not passing away until heaven and earth do. What does it mean? Well, did a copy of the Torah get nailed to the cross? No, but Jesus did. See, in Romans 7, Paul is arguing the reason you died to the law is through the body of Christ his actual body dying for you. The legal demands died. Or the, okay, the record of debt was canceled because he died, because you're included in him. And the death you deserve, he swallowed up completely, completely. So a bad answer to how to deal with the old covenant and Jesus and the new covenant is to say that Jesus came along, decided to do a course correction, and he poofed the law somehow. A bad answer would be, the new covenant is different because now God's dealing with the heart. Because that's like a, that's an odd thing to say about God because it's not like he's capricious. It's not like he changed halfway through. He's not like he was cutting his teeth, <laughs> practicing divinity, and he had to figure some stuff out like it was a trial run. No, God has always known what he's doing. He's always tried to appeal to the heart. He's always known what humans are capable of, and he's always tried to motivate us with his love. Jesus is showing us that the heart of God expressed in the law is inescapable, and we know what we deserve because his standard of love is burning hot. But thankfully, because of his burning hot love, he offers us grace through his body, being unified with him in his death and resurrection and life. So the life we live we live to God because the life we live is hidden in God's own life, Jesus Christ. So um, there's plenty of applications here for this. Um, the first and foremost, I, I want to comfort those of you who feel disappointed in your faith because the person who thinks, oh, Jesus came along and poofed the law. And now I, I sort of have to just... Christianness is sort of just being a good person by Jesus' power. That person is always going to find themselves frustrated and disappointed in themselves because, like, yeah, you're going to find out in a several hours from now your limitations with love. Okay, you're going to find that hatred and anger thing pop up in your heart, and that frustration is going to lead to bad words, and you're like, well, where'd that come from? <laughs> okay, so I want to comfort those of you who are constantly disappointed in yourselves. No, the new covenant is not hey, let's be great people with Jesus' power. The new covenant, Jesus said at the Lord's Supper, this is the blood of the covenant. What's the new covenant? Jesus' people being good people? The new covenant is his body broken for you, his blood shed for you. 
He is our covenant with God. Interestingly enough, Jesus is God. And so our covenant with God is God himself. How much more solid and sure is that? See, if we do the uh, old covenant thing, okay, it's just new rules. And now I'm just, I'm doing, I'm just, I have to be a Christian and then I'm being a good person. It's like, whoa, what I want is not a self-focus. How faithy am I today? How faithy was I yesterday? Oh, I wasn't very faithy this morning. I was just eating cereal. That wasn't like supernatural. I wasn't glowing and levitating in the Lord. I was just eating cereal. You know, <clears throat> or maybe I was cussing at the dog across the street because he was barking and waking me up. No, I don't want a self-focus. I want a Christ focus. So you're not even saved because you believed hard enough. And I don't know how to like, uh, is it, this is harder belief. You believe, <laughs> okay. Gino's probably like, cut the feed, cut the feed. He's going nuts. Um, <clears throat> the focus is on Christ and his finished works, not us and our, you know, did I say the prayer properly here or whatever? Okay, so it's a comfort to those of you who are nearly constantly disappointed in yourself and your performance. We look to Christ. We, you know, we only love uh, because he first loved us. We don't love because Jesus changed the rules and now the game's a little easier to play. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. I have the life of God and I'm saved from my sin and the power of sin and judgment because Jesus died sufficiently because he was raised powerfully enough and because he is raised and ascended in heaven and lives. He lives. Thanks. More grimacing. That's why I have the life of Christ because Christ lived. Christ died. He was buried and he's risen and he is risen. That is why I have the life of God. Uh, not because we've turned over a new leaf lately and I'm feeling really faithy. Okay. I have a comment now. Thank you guys. <clears throat> I have a comment. This may affect you in ways that you don't understand yet. So don't think of just practical ways to live this out. I also want you to spend some time in prayer. <laughs> Gino texted me, cut the feed. Thanks, Gino. Um, I want you to spend some time in prayer asking for God to help you meditate on the, uh, the burning hot love of God expressed in the Torah, but then really expressed in the life, death, and, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is our foundation. And the logic of we only love because he first loved us also works out like this. It's not that you can piece together an action plan on your own power uh, from what I've said. I want you to meditate on the love of Christ and what he's done for you. Because his love first, then you receiving it, then your love outward. That's the way it works. So um, I could go and tell you all the live long day how to be better. But there's no power in that. But there is power in Christ. So spend some time, if you can today, maybe this morning, maybe right now, meditating on the love of Christ and his body broken for you. The second thing I want to say to you is this. We get into a funk. Uh, we get into all kinds of funks, um, spiritually, emotionally, even physically. And um, we are not going to be able to have you come to the front for prayer and Gino's going to dismiss and release, and he's going to say a prayer. But um, if you really want to come to prayer or get prayer, um, you can contact Jolene Michelle, or you can email me. Um, I'm going to put my phone number in the live chat if you don't have it already. My email's on hope.org, so you can find me there. And um, there's my phone number. I just put it in. If you want prophetic encouragement, Send us the request, even if it's, I want prophetic encouragement. That's fine. You don't have to give us a prompt about what. Um, what we're going to do is try to get you paired with people who are going to pray for you and send you an encouraging word. Because um, I think it's often the case that we need to be reminded, like smacked in the head, reminded of the love of God for us, reminded of the power of Christ's body broken for us, and to... Um, to snap out of whatever it is with that held us in its, our, our, its grip. Um, and um, so please do that. Please take them up on, up on that offer. Sometimes we make an offer and folks think, oh, well, I don't want to get in the queue because they're so busy. And then tons of people who could have gotten prophetic encouragement didn't. 
Um, the, the last thing I'd like to offer is if you want to talk more about specifics of how this might, this understanding of Christ's work might work out in your life or in your, um, your devotion, your study of scripture or whatever, um, please talk to me because like I said earlier, the logic is this way. It starts with the love of God and then it being appropriated to you. And then it flows out from there. And that's the proper order of events as far as, um, right living is concerned as I understand it. But you might be stuck in any one of those steps. Maybe it's a, I see this in scripture and it doesn't, it doesn't seem right with me. Can you talk to me about this one particular thing? And man, <laughs> I've been at home a lot lately and I am calling people, but I would love to chat with you about anything random theologically. I know Gina would too. We could call, um, we could talk. <laughs> the phones don't look like this anymore. Uh, we could FaceTime. We could, uh, we could do any Marco Polo or Google Hangout or whatever. Or maybe it's the appropriating it to myself part. Maybe you feel like, yeah, I solidly believe that God loves me, but the appropriating it to myself part, I'm having a hard time. With. Um, contact Frank Kostenbader. Uh, the, we have a Stephen ministry that's trained and they're ready and they're praying. If you want to talk, um, contact Gino, contact me. And then um, that process naturally leads to outflow of love. And I, on that topic, I said it earlier, but I just want to say it again. Hope Chapel, I'm very impressed with the way you've been reaching out to each other online lately. Um, I just want to affirm you in that. I want to affirm you to, to continue to ask God, how can I love my neighbor in this time? And uh, I just want to say thank you to everyone who's been chatting with me on the, the live stream. Thank you for all the texts. I appreciate you listening to me. I know this is weird and it's going to take um, some adjusting for the next couple weeks. I pray that it ends soon. And now I'm going to cut to Gino, and he's going to release us. Oh, hey, there's Mandy. Say hi, everybody, to Mandy. Hey, guys. Okay. <laughs> okay, Gina. Take it away, brother. Thank you, Matt. Uh, that was really uh, quite amazing, actually. And uh, I just want to echo a couple things. Uh, I'm also grateful for the way you guys and gals have uh, uh, reached out to one another uh, during this uh, coronavirus uh, season. I want to encourage you to keep doing that. In fact, let's find new ways to do that and make sure that no one um, uh, is left in a needy place. So, so we're, we're, going, we're working on some things as a staff, but actually the creativity of the body of Christ here at Hope Chapel is what we need in this season. So as you think of things or come across some good ideas, contact us. Hey, Gina, have you guys tried this? Or Matt, how about doing this? Uh, please, um, please continue to do that. Um, I just want to add one thing. Um, I loved what Matt said about uh, good cop, bad cop. It's like God in the Old Testament is a bad cop and Jesus is the good cop and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And then also, um, I loved, uh, I loved, I just loved the, the way he set up the, um, um, the Old Testament is the hard, mean God and the New Testament is the God of grace. There's not, nothing like that is true at all. Actually, the 2 Corinthians 5.19 says God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. I just want to remind you of that. Matt may have mentioned it. I was in and out a little bit as I was listening to him, but God was in Christ. It's not, a, it's not um, as, there, as though there are two separate deities and uh, at war with one another. Not at all. So I just want to, to um, encourage you to think like that. Uh, uh, appreciate Matt's good teaching here. So there are a couple of things that I want to say as we um, close up. Uh, so one thing is administrative, and that is our church offices will be closed to people just dropping in. So we're, they will be closed. We will have people here working. So if you need an appointment with Matt or me or somebody else uh, on Hope Chapel staff, please call us, text us, email us, and let us make appointment, appointments with you. We can meet you in our offices. Uh, they, are, they are clean, and we will be uh, careful with uh, COVID-19 protocols. But uh, we will not be waiting there in our offices um, or working in our offices because I want everybody to be as um, separated as possible and follow, follow the protocols as, as clearly as possible. We're going to practice a great social distancing. But if you want us or you need us, please give us a call. As a staff, we will also be reaching out to you as well. Um, I also want to say uh, thanks to some people this morning. So first of all, uh, we have a great tech team in Jerry Latham, Bill Ledbetter, and Will Morris. They're back in the, in the room back here. And so thank you guys. appreciate it very much what you've done and continue to do for us. 
Um, it's really, really quite amazing that Hope Chapel set up this way. Uh, I want to remind uh, you all that we will gather this coming Wednesday in a congregational meeting at a WebEx thing that our tech guys are setting up. So please join us on that. I want to say thank you to the, like, to the worship team who braved um, social distancing protocols to come up here and lead us in worship. Abigail and Bethany and Melody, um, Chris on the drums, Andrew on the uh, pro presenter, Josiah in the back running sound. These young adults have done a good job. Uh, obeying the rules as it were, but, but following Jesus and serving us well. So I want to say thank you to you all. Thank you very much. And some of them are still in the room here. It's pretty cool to, to hang out with them. Uh, and then the last thing that, uh, let's see here, make sure I got everything. All right. I wanted to say um, a couple of prayers as we close. Uh, and uh, I was encouraged by one of our uh, leaders here recently that now in this season, a lot of people are afraid and may not feel secure in their relationship with God. So I want to pray with you, if that's where you are, that you would receive Christ as your own and, and become part of the family of God by faith. We can do that uh, this way in, uh, in this prayer. And then I also want to pray for us that are experiencing difficulty and fear as a result of um, particularly the economic slowdown that is upon us, that is coming in, in here in greater measure. Uh, uh, so those of us that look ahead into the future and go, man, things, things may get worse before they get better. I want to pray for us that we would walk in faith. So let's do those two things, then we'll close out this morning. So, so if you are a person that is concerned about your relationship with God, if, that you may, be, may feel like you're far from God, I just want to encourage you today that you can say yes to Jesus in a simple word of uh, commitment to Christ. And so if, uh, I'm going to pray a prayer. I want you to follow me in the prayer where you are. And then we'll say the amen to that. And I'll jump into the second prayer. But please follow me. If you feel at a distance from God, just say what I say. I'll say something. I'll pause. I'll say another thing. I'll pause. And you just come with me. All right. So, Father in heaven, um, we thank you that you hear us when we cry out to you, however distant we are from you, that you are ever listening to us. And I would say it this way, Lord, that you are ever listening to me, that you know me, you know my heart. And Lord, I am, I am concerned, maybe even afraid, that I am far from you. And so I pray that you would hear me in these moments as I come to you and confess the distance and confess maybe even the things that I believe keep me from you. And I pray for your forgiveness and for your help to leave those things behind in order to follow you, to become part of your family, part of your kingdom. So I thank you for hearing me. And I thank you as Matt explained. It is the death of Jesus in whom I find life. I have died with Christ and now I will live with Christ just by saying I want to belong. Will you, will you take me in? And I say thank you. I thank you, Jesus, that you have heard my prayer, that you've died for my sins, and that now I belong to the family of God by faith. So I, I'm just very grateful in this moment. I want to say thank you for one more thing. I want to thank you, Jesus, that you didn't just die for my sins, but I believe that you rose from the grave. And in your rising from the grave, I will also have new life. Because in you, I also will be resurrected and find eternal life now. In Jesus' name, amen. So Lord, I want to turn and pray for us as a community here at Hope Chapel. That you would um, draw us to you in our private devotions, in our time as a family, talking about uh, spiritual things or even maybe things that aren't so spiritual, but, but aware that you are with us, that you would draw us toward you uh, so that our anxieties, our fears would begin to dissipate in your presence. Surely none of this is a surprise to you, and we believe that is the case. And surely it is also the case that you have our concerns in mind. You are very clear there 
uh, in Matthew chapter 6, we said, don't worry about what you need to eat or how to be clothed. Your father knows that you need all these things, but seek first the kingdom of God. That's what we want to become, persons seeking the kingdom with our brothers and sisters, not out of fear or out of um, anxiety, but out of adoration and, and confidence that you hear us, that you see us, that you know our needs before we, uh, for we are aware of them and that you meet them in Christ and in the company of our fellow believers. So help us as a community to serve your purposes in the, in the wor world today, among our neighbors, those that are around us, Christian or not, and especially, Lord, that we would be good to those in the household of God. So, Lord, help us to do all these things in the mighty name of Jesus. We all say amen. All right, have a good evening, good afternoon. We'll see you later. Bye-bye.